Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another live edition of Mike Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. If you're joining us live on Facebook, thanks for tuning in. Feel free to drop a comment. And as long as it's PG, because there might be kids watching, we'll be happy to read it on the air. And if you're watching this on demand through our YouTube and Spotify pages, we're happy to have you as well. This is our first podcast since we officially launched on Spotify. We've been posting a lot of our previous episodes, so certainly check out our library of content. And adding to that library is Tamika Johnson, a 2009 WNBA champion when she was a member of the Phoenix Mercury. She recently won her first state championship as a head coach for John Curtis High School girls basketball. Last weekend, they claimed the Division I LHSAA state championship. Tamika, thanks for joining us. And if you don't mind, for you, how surreal was it when you claimed the state tournament title? You know, you've won a championship before, and obviously a professional league title and a high school state championship. Not necessarily equal, but not many athletes can pull it off like you have. There have been former WNBA players who have had a lot of success at the college level. Dawn Staley comes to mind. She won an NCAA championship, but I don't think there are too many out there who can say they have a WNBA championship and a high school state championship. Well, first of all, Mike, thanks for having me. I will start off by saying I took over for Barbara Ferris, who was a WNBA champion, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, she has some with Detroit. Um, and she's won four. She won four in a row. Um, but to be honest, to answer your question, it, it was an absolute amazing feeling. I took over the team. Um, and it, it was supposed to be a rebuilding year, possibly. Um, we was possibly picked third in district to win, like the odds was against us with COVID situations. Take, I took us out of tournaments. We probably played 10 to 12 less games than uh, most of our opponents or whatnot, but the kids brought in. Um, I met them where they were, where they were uh, allowed them to feel comfortable, uh, allowed them to uh, get to know me as well as I got to know them. Um, I didn't go in as a dictator or anything like that. I went in there an open, with an uh, open mind and tried to, again, meet them where they were. They bought into it, and it was amazing. As much basketball as I've ever played or seen, we were down seven with three minutes left to go in the game and ended up closing the game out on the 11-0 uh, run to be able to uh, obtain the title, which gave the school the fifth one in a row. Um, so it was an awesome feeling. And just for clarification, do you have a shot clock in Louisiana high school basketball? We do not, but I don't like to play slow, slow hold the ball either. So, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because a lot of people are uh, starting to talk about that. And I think it's something that needs to be addressed, especially since the kids are going to transition to a shot, shot clock in, in college. So, um, Maybe that's something that needs to be talked about. Well, Minnesota, they haven't had a shot clock either. And I asked that. I guess it's more impressive that you finish on an 11-0 run with three minutes to go because I see this a lot at the high school game. Without a shot clock, teams will start stalling when they have a lead of a couple possessions or more. But the flip side to that is, especially if you're not prepared for it, or as you put it, you have an aggressive approach. You don't like to play slow the more you play that style, the more chances you have to make a mistake. As I've noted, as possessions get longer, most teams aren't used to running possessions that are longer than 30, 35 seconds. When you go right. on that, it gets a little dicey because, you know, things might get a little sloppy. You might lose your focus just a little bit. Uh, but no matter what, a title is a title. But having to come back from seven down with – just three minutes left. Of course, you've seen it happen many times in the college and pro levels, but you figure, all right, we've got plenty of possessions left in high school in states without a shot clock. You've got to work for it. And your team did. And here is this rebuilding team, although winning four in a row before you got there. I don't know how that <laughs> rebuilding seems to work. I think they just reload, but uh, <laughs> you have continued the right. you go. They uh, they they graduated a, a, a big senior class, Gatorade Player of the Year. 
who ended up being freshman of the year at the university that she signed to, um, and some other players that went on to play D1 basketball. So they graduated a really big class that had worked hard. And that was, that was a special class because they won every year in high school. Um, so you're, you're right. But the, ta- the, the pieces that was left there, um, I didn't go in looking at them as if they weren't capable of doing anything. I made them feel just as important as whomever had been left. Um, but to talk about the last three minutes, without a shot clock, we were in the bonus. And they ended up following, stopping the clock and giving us opportunity. And we would go, we were in a one and one and we would get to the line, make one, miss one, but some kind of way we came up with an offensive rebound. Same thing, foul, make one, miss one. I couldn't have written it up if I wanted to. So it was uh, absolutely amazing. That's what we love about sports. You can't make any of this up. You just go along for the ride. Uh, There is an athlete who wanted to pass along a greeting, a former teammate of yours, actually, Alexis Gray Lawson, if that name uh, rings. (laughs) Yes. Hi, Lex. How are you? (laughs) Those are really good things I follow up, so uh, I'm happy for her. We'll see if she uh, drops a response on our Facebook feed, and it's like, oh, that's right. You two were teammates for a year. I had no idea she played. I think I remember her name (laughs) until... She uh, came up here. She was the head coach for Como Park girls basketball for a few years. Right. But... Listen, Alexis was a force to be reckoned with. A lot of people slept on her. Her size was spectacular. Her ball handling, her shooting skills. She was a force to be reckoned with for sure. I know for years a running joke I had with her is uh, every time the WNB season would roll around, I'd ask, oh, can you still play? And she's like, of course I can still play. <laughs> I'm yeah, sure that's not that the question too. that you're asking. Unless you get older and older, you're not going to get too many of us that's going to say, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> like say, like, yes, she's still feeling like she can play. So you would fall in that camp? You could still go out there and hold your own? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I know this for a fact. <laughs> well, I am not in a position to disagree, Tamika. <laughs> I don't know if I would want to do it as much because it's not my time anymore. But I do, um, every now and then I'll get out there and scrimmage uh, with or against the kids. So I still have it a little bit. So I'm curious, Tamika, if you don't mind going back to the star, what was your first memory or moment that got you attracted to the sport of basketball? Oh, I don't even know if I can think back that far, but I, I tell everybody I came out of the womb playing basketball. Both my mom and dad were athletes they played um, my entire family were athletic. My uncles played, I had one of them tried out for the NBA a couple times, played overseas. So it was just in me to be able to, to the love for the game. You couldn't be in our house and not watching the Chicago Bulls play or uh, anybody on the 96 Olympic Dream Team um, and not know the game of basketball and the history of it. So uh, it started way back when I started playing organized basketball when I was five years old and I haven't turned back yet. Going off of the Bulls dynasty, that's when I started getting into the sport, the 96 Olympic team. I've had a lot of people come on, including WNBA alumni who point to that group as the spark, the ignition, the genesis, whatever word you want to use. So inspiration so many stories started with that 96 team who are the idols you looked up to when you started picking up the ball at the age of five and obviously we know the rest of the story but who are the players you idolized early on it was michael jordan um it was also kevin johnson uh, and I, I would talk about Kevin more than I would talk about Mike only because, and I'm, I'm calling him first name like we're friends, but I was talking about, I would talk about Michael, Kevin Johnson more than I would talk about um, Michael Jordan. And I think um, a lot of people would talk about Michael, but I, I, I enjoy the way Kevin Johnson played the game. Um, I enjoy watching everybody. And yes, the 96 Olympic team was uh, like a pivotal point in the game, but there were so many that came before. Uh, that I had a great appreciation for as well. As we got older and then you watch the Olympics, um, Dawn Staley was a phenomenal person for me. Um, I enjoyed watching her. I think I gravitated to her because she was small, but not that she was just small, but she was dominant. She was dominant and she was forceful. Uh, she was a leader. Um, and I enjoyed it. I watched her and 
Cynthia Cooper and Cheryl Swoops and them and everybody that came out from that from that Olympics and went on to uh, the WNBA and stuff like that. So uh, if, it, if I had to say one of the, the two guys, it would be those two people. And um, for females, it would definitely be Dawn Staley. And all fine choices. And as we noted before, so many of them would have success either in the pros or later on in, as coaches or what other, whatever careers they decided to pursue. But that's a pretty strong list there. Is Cheryl Swoops uh, part of that Houston Comets dynasty? Don Staley building up a culture at South Carolina to help right. dethrone the UConn dynasty and you know, took a program that didn't have much history and you know, she's turned them into a powerhouse. You've got to keep an eye out on those Gamecocks every season now. So Absolutely. They're in the SEC, so they give the Tigers a problem every year. But you know what? I, I'm very fortunate to be able to transition to because Lisa Leslie, Tina Thompson, all they were my teammates. So I, I, I was absolutely fortunate enough to play against Dawn um, early on in my career and then be teammates with both Tina and Lisa and learn from them. I had uh, some very promising uh, vets, Talisha Milton Jones, um, Miriam Page, Shamika Hosequall, Charlotte Smith-Taylor, everybody that's um, pretty much in the coaching arena and stuff like that. So I, I've been really, really fortunate for uh, the veterans that I've had. How surreal was it when you had the opportunity to go up against these names you grew up watching? Uh, you mentioned being teammates with Lisa Leslie and Tina Thompson when the two of them were with the Sparks going up against Don Staley and Delisha Milton Jones. You mentioned her name too. So here you are, you're watching these players lay the framework for what is now the WNBA's 25th season. They started their celebration this week, but when you made your way in and you got a chance to go up against some of these names, what was that like? At first, from afar, it was absolutely great. Um, and that doesn't mean that it wasn't as it got on, but once you put your uniform on and you string up the shoes, like the respect that you have for them doesn't leave, but the competitor in you rise up. So it was absolutely great to be on the court uh, with and against uh, many of them to be able to see how I was um, as in the competitive range to be able to compete against them night in and night out. Uh, it was absolutely a uh, joyous experience. Um, and I have a great appreciation for every last one of them. And the ones that I have relationships with is absolutely great. Funny you mentioned it. I played with both Delicia, Lisa, and Tina on separate teams. Delicia in Washington, Lisa in LA, Tina in um, in Seattle. But then Delicia and I also left Washington at the same time and went back to LA together. So um, I had to have them. I, I got to share each one of them individually and get to learn them uh, a little bit uh, on my own as well. That's pro sports for you, though. You never know who your allegiances are. And, and you know the saying, everybody knows everybody. That really is the case. But you right. Milton Jones, she and I become pen pals. We go back and forth. And uh, Tina Thompson, we did a couple interviews. Lisa Leslie, I came in in her last season. So we really didn't cross paths all that much. And my first season was a blur. But uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Tamika, you attended Bonneville High School, if I'm correct, in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Grew up in New Orleans? The New Orleans Kenner area, yes. New okay. Orleans, then Kenner, yes. So New Orleans metro area. Mm -hmm. What would you make of the atmosphere, the culture surrounding prep basketball at the time? Because you, know, you and Simone Augustus uh, were two big names coming out of Louisiana. You probably remember the... SI cover where Simone Augustus was tabbed as the next Michael Jordan. And so many players have been given that moniker since then. And it's like, you know, I think Simone Augustus and yourself uh, are fine just the way you are. <laughs> I understand I that comparison, but what would you make of the culture and the hype surrounding it? Because when you and Simone were high school athletes, for example, there was no Snapchat, no Instagram, no overtime, Facebook, Twitter, no social media of any kind, no way to get your reels out there. So you had to pine for those newspaper clippings, maybe some highlight packages on the news. Uh, but what would what do you recall from your time as a high school athlete? 
think I can classify it as fun. And because of all the things that you said, like there wasn't all the social media attention and it wasn't all that, but every, which means that everybody was a lot more invested. Um, there were so many people uh, coming to the game to support. So many people wanted to get behind. So many, not just family members, people in the community, people uh, in the neighborhoods that that was a fan of you, that watched you grow up, that wanted to see you uh, succeed. Um, and at that time in Louisiana, it was so many people and so many individuals that was on D1 uh, levels. The AAU programs were uh, really about teaching and making sure that your your game grew. It wasn't about everything else that it is about now. Um, people actually took the time, took the time. Like we would go to AAU and come back to high school and was like, we got better during the summer. Now everybody want to be on the same team and this is it's not the same. So it was absolutely fun. It was competitive. Um, you would see against, you would see other people and you would see other talents and you need to just have a respect for it, but was happy to see it, to be able to compete. And it was a competing level across the board. So it was definitely an amazing time. And I just want to make this clear because I think I said Bonneville, it's Bonnebel. I don't want uh, Bonnebel alumni coming after me. So just wanted to make sure. <laughs> well, they <that> won't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to make sure I get my facts right, even if I have to correct myself on my podcast series or any broadcast that I do. When did you sense that your pursuit of basketball could get you places? I imagine you got your first offer early on, but when did you get the feeling like, hey, this could be my ticket, so to speak? I'll tell you what, I, I, I started receiving like letters in the mail and I don't know if that really means a lot, that then it was just interesting to know that you were on somebody's radar. But Kim Mulkey, when she was at Louisiana Tech, she was making sure that she kept a, connect, a connection and stuff like that. Um, but I think I knew more of my sophomore year in high school excuse me, because it never went away and it, it started increasing and it started uh, getting more and more of an importance. And I was like, okay, I have an opportunity to play basketball. I was always a, a moment at a time individual, but I saw focus on high school. And then whenever it happens there, I'll go there. As far as it, um, me knowing it was going to be my ticket, I didn't. I just knew I loved it. I just know I loved the game. And I knew that I was gonna play it to the best of my ability and go hard, give it a hundred percent. And it worked out. Uh even though I was small, you can't teach hard and you can't teach height. And I never backed down from a challenge. Um, uh, even getting drafted. Every my size was always a problem for everybody else, but I've been this size my entire life, so I never thought about it. <laughs> If you don't mind elaborating on that, Tamika, usually you were the shortest player on your team, especially when you got to the pros. And I have covered a lot of athletes up here in Minnesota. There is a name you might want to keep an eye out for Alexis Pratt. She's also five foot three, but the fastest player in her class, all of her AAU and high school teammates have joked with me that they don't even bother trying to keep up with her on fast breaks because she'll just beat them all. And she's a track champion on top of it but you play in a sport that favors height. Like you said, you can't teach height, you can't teach heart, but you know, I've had a lot of athletes who are six feet plus and they go on about how it's hard to find clothes and shoes that would fit, for example, but the sport was welcoming for them. How did you compensate knowing that regardless of your matchup, you likely were going to be one of the smallest players on the floor. You was gonna have to prove to me. A competitor never thinks about that. You is is win or lose. That's it. And then it's a team sport. So whatever our game plan was, we would make sure that we executed it to the T. If I needed help on something, I had teammates that was gonna help. If they needed help on something, I was gonna make sure that I did that. I will say that being a small player, you have to work almost ten times harder. Um, to almost get the same type of recognition, but it teaches you so many different things that uh, that you can carry with you off the court that you don't even realize that you just know that you're in a situation to get paid to perform and paid to do something that you absolutely love to do, which doesn't make you feel like a job. Do you recall when you got your first offer, how many offers you were considering and what led you to commit to LSU? 
Ooh, the first one I'm gonna call. No, I don't. I know my phone was ringing a lot as soon as uh, <laughs> the calling day was uh, was allowed. But I narrowed it down really fast. It was between Louisiana Tech and LSU, honestly. And I enjoyed Coach Gunner to the fullest, the late great Sue Gunner. And I enjoyed Kim Mulkey as well. Well, when I go to visit La Tech, the day of my visit, Kim Mulkey had been quit because they couldn't reach an agreement on the contract situation. And that's when she was headed to Bella. I think that was the driving force that pushed me towards LSU, the one person that I had connected with, the one person that I had spoken to the most, the one person that you know I thought could help grow my game is now gone. So it didn't make I didn't see where it made sense for me to go in that. And that's not a knock on Coach Barmore, Leon Barmore at all. I just was connected with Kim Mulkey at the time. So when I went out there, the visit was uh, good. Cheryl Ford was my host. Katrina Farson, who was somebody who had just went through the same situation between LSU and uh, La Tech. Um, and she talked to me about it and was honest with me, and I made the decision to go to LSU. Whatever happened to Kim Mulkey anyway? Oh, let's see. <laughs> she was a national champion of, uh, several times over there in Baylor, so she's doing very well in Waco. <laughs> but I can understand your reasoning. That's something I run into a lot even now when an athlete is recruited and then the coach that is going after them leaves, is fired, or changes schools. That affects the dynamic. And I don't think anyone would protest your decision to go to LSU considering what you accomplished there and who you got to play with. Right. At LSU, you set the school record in career assists and the SEC record as well. And in your last year, your teammates included Simone Augustus and Sylvia Fowle. So a couple of your old college buddies you got to play against for several years in the WNBA. What do you recall from your experience as a college student athlete and what did you enjoy most about representing LSU? Um, I think the team camaraderie. Honestly, um, and I think a lot of it has to pay. I cannot have a conversation about LSU without paying tribute to Sue Gunner. Um, Coach Gunner was a phenomenal lady, a phenomenal woman, fierce competitor, but she cared more about who we were as young women, who we were, who we were going to become as women than winning. She knew that we were all competitors, so she knew that we that part we were never lacking, but who we were as an individual away from the game and how we represented our families and our makers, and our families and how we represented her uh, was very important. And that's something that she instilled in us. Um, I think the idea and the, the notion of her treating everybody the same, it didn't matter if you was the CEO or the janitor, she was gonna speak to you and greet you the same and it rubbed off on us. Um, I think the life lessons that I was able to get um, means more to me than what we were able to really accomplish there. Now, you mentioned two of the top players um, that has come through there with myself. And me being an assist leader and all this kind of stuff, look who I had to pass the ball to. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, two of Minnesota's finest, um, with Simone Augustus and Sylvia, uh, Sylvia Files, um, they were – hands-on, two of the best that I've played with. Um, and I was happy to be the point guard for the both of them. But without them, without Coach Gunner, without the rest of my teammates, um, there is no Tamika Johnson lead in the SEC. And you can, you can be, you're capable of doing it, but if you don't have people surrounding you that can finish it, it doesn't happen. So uh, I think just being able to grow, learn, and to compete in the SEC, night in and night out, it's something that you won't forget. When you put it that way, Tamika, it's no wonder why you had so many assists. Uh, you had so many players who could make your job easy. I mean, you just pass the ball to Simone out on the wing or feed it to Sylvia down low and <laughs> let them do the rest. So that is a good point. How would you say the three of you 
have grown and evolved. You know, of course, Simone is finishing out her career with LA now, but she was part of the Minnesota dynasty. She got Sylvia Fowles, or I should say Sylvia Fowles wanted to come to Minnesota. And then she got to extend that run with a couple of titles. And that's the thing. All three of you won WNBA championships. Simone and Sylvia maybe have more trophies than you do, but again, that a champion is a champion. And I reference a line Scott Van Pelt uses on SportsCenter. It's really hard to win one championship, let alone multiple. So even one trophy says a lot about you, your team and whatnot. But looking back at your time as college teammates and seeing what the three of you have become since then, how would you say you have evolved as athletes and as citizens? I think it's more of growing. I think we've all grown. Uh, We were young teenage kids on campus trying to grow into and blossom into the young women that we are today. Um, I'm extremely happy for and proud of both Simone and Sylvia. And what they're doing uh, with their with themselves, still being able to play, uh, doing things in the community, um, giving back to basketball, doing things with AU um, programs and stuff like that. I think it's phenomenal. And I think that we are all images of Sue Gunner. Uh, we all represent LSU, the purple and gold. We, we love it. We wear it. Um, just being decent human beings that's uh, trying to give back to the youth and trying to make a difference in, in the areas and people's lives that come across. Part of your college journey included two final fours with two different coaches. You mentioned the late Sue Gunter, and I think her name is going to be mentioned for decades to come as far as pioneers of women's basketball. Pokey Chapman takes over the following year, and that was part of a streak where LSU ended up playing five Final Fours in a row with three different coaches, Sue Gunter, Pokey Chapman, and then Van Chancellor took over for Pokey. But you got to play in two of them. What was that experience like, you know, going from this high school athlete, you commit to LSU, and you know, maybe you don't win the championship, but making the Final Four, that's a big deal that a lot of colleges will promote in their media guides. To do it with two different coaches, you know, how exciting was that for you? It was absolutely exciting. I had a, a, a great coaching staff with uh, Pokey being the predecessor of Coach Gunner, and then you had Bob Starkey, who basically ran our offense. Um, Tyler Berry, uh, Joseph Carlito, the supporting cast. Uh, we had a really good run, and to be able to make it to the Final Four the first time and it being in our hometown um, was absolutely amazing. There was this down point for that, and that was uh, that I ended up turning the ball over in one of the in the last five seconds. They score, they go on to the championship game. I come back the following year, make it to the final four again. Um, you work hard, you work extremely hard to try to accomplish uh, those things, and um, we were able to to be in the atmosphere, to be uh, to work that hard to of the 64 teams as in the NCAA to be down to four and knowing that you've competed, of course you would love to be able to walk away with a championship. Um, But, you know, the feeling is, I'm not going to say it's just, it's not just as, just as great, but it is a great feeling. When you realize that in all these tournaments, there can only be one winner and no one wants to lose. (laughs) I think any athlete will tell you that no matter what level, but I think over time you do appreciate, hey, you know, how many schools make it this far and to do it consecutively. You know, we expect that out of UConn and Tennessee, for example. Schools like yours, maybe not so much. So I think you did all that. Right. But hey, I, only the outside world think that. that, that Believe me, true. everybody that like, <laughs> expects to do that. And so that's only the outside world. And I can, I, I can not just LSU, I'm pretty sure every school start out thinking that and believing that. But um, in the SEC, man, you you end up competing night in and night out. And um, we definitely challenged ourselves to compete and be there every opportunity that we had. And that's the important thing. You know, it doesn't matter what folks like myself think. You know, as long as you think, hey, we can do this, you know, maybe it does happen, maybe it doesn't. But no, you don't want to take yourself out before you even tip off. So that, that's Absolutely. really like that attitude. On that note, Tamika, what do you remember from your SEC days? Because Tennessee still was the big power, and they've been hanging around since then. But as you were making your way through, that's when Candace Parker was making a name for herself at Tennessee. 
and I would need another minute or two to think of all the other athletes who had to go against the SEC, historically one of the toughest conferences in women's basketball. What was right. that competition like? I can tell you this. You never went to sleep the night before thinking that the next game was going to be easy. Every school in the SEC was stacked with talent. Um, the South Carolinas wasn't as talented as – um, as it is now, but believe me, you couldn't go to sleep the night before and be like, oh, it's going to be a cakewalk. I was fierce competitive. As you mentioned, Candace coming up, uh, she was al along with Sylvia, and she ended up being my teammate in L.A. as well. Phenomenal athlete, uh, fierce competitor as uh, also. Um, but you think about the Sydney Spencers and the Ashley Robinsons and the Shauna Zomans. Um, who else? The list can go on and on and on. There, Tennessee has so many people, but the ten the, the Tennessee LSU games were always fun. They were always packed. Uh, it was always a competitive, and it would go back and forth. You win some, you lose some. Um, Tennessee and Coach Summit was fierce competitors, and they challenged us, and we challenged them to the tee night in and night out. We would play them in regular season played them in conference tournament and we ended up in the same bracket on the same side every time for the uh for the ncaa's as well but it was absolutely fun it really was now at the time you were playing as a high school and college athlete the WNBA had been established it was still in its infancy it's like yeah i think i forget when they switched to quarters I think it was 06. So we were still playing halves, for example, and still, they were playing more so with college rules and the pro rules. But when did you get the feeling or the sense that you would have an opportunity to continue playing basketball? I don't know what the thought process is for athletes like yourself. You've got a lot of exposure, of course, through your final fours, but that's one thing. Getting drafted and staying in the WNBA is a whole nother thing. When did you get that feeling that you could get paid to play basketball? In college, for sure. Junior and senior year, your coaches start talking to you about it. Um, then your senior year, once you get an agent um, and people start approaching you, uh, you know where you're going to be picked up. Although, although it's so funny that Van Chancellor ended up coming to LSU because up, at, up until like the – the night of the draft, I knew that I was going to Houston at number five. I knew this. And he decides to take Sancho Little the next morning. And I was like, Coach Chancellor, what, what happened? And after that moment, he needed a point guard. And this is this and blah, blah, blah. So he ended up coming to LSU. And I was like, Coach Chancellor, I mean, what have you? He's like, I just think I watched it too much. Johnson, I knew that. I, I just think I just watched it too much. And it came back to bite me. It came back to bite me big time because I needed a point guard or whatnot. So up until um, the night before the draft, I was actually, um, you know, the night of the night before the draft, I knew for a fact the next morning I was going to be in Houston, which was perfect. It's three hours away from, you know, my family and it's this. And Coach Chester threw a wrench in it and sent me to to Washington, which was absolutely great. It worked out for me to uh, under Miss Johnson. The Washington uh, organization was new enough to come under her leadership, but it was great. Um, so. I knew how we were playing and the caliber of players that we was playing against and one of our conferences being one of the toughest ones that was constantly being watched. I knew we had a, a fair chance. What do you recall from draft day, the surprise that you fell from fifth to sixth? Uh, you still managed to win rookie of the year, uh, which uh, I, doesn't always happen when you're not the number one pick. It, we've had had exceptions. Well, the most recent... <laughs> Rookies of the year came from the Minnesota Lynx with Collier and Dangerfield, and they cool. were both drafted six, like you were. So that number six spot has some luck in there too. Uh, but it might be, it might be Mike. <laughs> it, might, it, it might be uh, coming up sixes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. But what do you recall from draft day, draft night, and after you? absorb the shock of going to Washington. Like you said, it worked out for you. And obviously your professional career panned out quite well, but what do you remember when you heard your name and you knew this was official, I was going to be a WNBA player? I think more, a lot of the nerves, like you have so many emotions going on 
it's it's chilly in the room because it needs to be so you're kind of cold you're shivering your nerves are all over the place um but to hear my name call and to see the smile on my mom's and my my late grandmother's face um meant everything to me uh, because i know that they were extremely proud and they was extremely happy of the things that i had not accomplished um more than anything my grandmother was happy that i was able to that i graduated and didn't have to go back and finish um, but that moment of, of gratification up on the, their face and the, the smiles up on their face was enough for me um, to say, OK, I've gotten this far. And now I know that I need to keep keep pushing to make sure that, you know, that smile that that doesn't go away. And as we stated a couple minutes ago, you won Rookie of the Year in 2005 and you fit right in like you came in and it was almost like you were still balling at LSU and I can see why you got rookie of the year I wasn't following the league yet but you were second in the league in assists first in assist percentage so you were dropping dimes like you were dropping dimes at LSU what do you remember from that first season and how surreal was it to get rookie of the year so many times that award goes to the number one overall pick and usually they deserve it. I should say there is no athlete that doesn't deserve those awards, but it's not common for picks outside of number one to get that honor. And here you are proving yourself in your first season. I'm sure that had to be a gratifying moment. It really was. And I, I, I was fortunate enough, like I said, I had Muriel Page, Charlotte Smith Taylor, uh, Charlotte Smith now, and Delisha Milton Jones as my veterans. And they took me, the three of them took me up underneath their wings, uh, allowed me to be the competitor that I was. I also had Elena Beard on my team, I had Coco and Kelly Miller on my team. I had some uh, really good post players. I had Chastity Melvin, who's in the, who's with the uh, Phoenix Mercury. Um, Kayla Jones, Nakia Sanford, like I had a, a good veteran. Even Tamisha Jackson was on the team, another uh, point guard who played at La Tech, who could show me certain things, and I got to compete in and compete night in and night out. I had Richie Artabato at as a coach who mine just ran and ran and ran, so he would put you in different places, and the offense said well for me. He let the ball stay in my hand, and I was able to facilitate with the – the, the women that I was surrounded by. At this point, you're a professional athlete that's getting paid to do your job, and it's the best of the best. So it's kind of hard to not um, not be able to accomplish that when you're surrounded with, with talented females. And then you discovered the business aspect of it. Of course, a lot of athletes still go overseas to supplement their income. You were no exception. You did double duty for over 10 years. Yes. And I certainly understand why. Uh, and I think as you were alluding to before we started with players understanding that they have a voice, they can make an impact. I think we're seeing that both in activism and in athletic activism as well. Right. I like to think, or I, I think that Brianna Stewart's injury a couple of years ago really put the spotlight on this issue that, hey, it's not a great look if your league's top player goes down with an injury because she has to play overseas to make enough money to support herself. Right. But that and it's, it's, it ahead. sucks that it had to be that long um, because there's so many people that came before uh, Brianna that um, injured themselves. And this is, but I'm glad that it was talked about it enough to make some changes. I'm glad that it was seen. And and I and I hate I hate that it had to come through an injury. I hate that she had to be um, the focal point of it and all this kind of stuff. But it brought about change, so I'm extremely happy um, about that. And it allowed things to get going even more. Now there were some people that had been trying to speak out and stuff like that, and it wasn't as popular. I and mean, it's still not to the day people still don't like it. But it's more it become it's becoming more of a norm. Um, and what uh, the Seattle Storm and Brianna Stewart and Alicia Club, Jewel Lloyd, Suber, what they're doing and, and utilizing a voice, as well as Neka Gumake, the, the league uh, president and stuff like that, what they're doing to bring about the change to help, not just for the people that's playing now, but the kids that's coming up behind the, for the future of the game to help it grow is phenomenal, to be honest. 
And something I like to point out with these discussions is that this was the case for many men's leagues too. They had to take on other jobs in those early years, NBA, NFL, no matter which league, there was a time when those leagues weren't multi-million dollar empires. So I don't know if it was as much as this one though, because even in their in their lack of multi-million dollars, they were still high up on the hierarchy with the finances that that they were given. So um, until you're in the situation and under really understanding and having to receive the check and stuff like that, it's almost like here's what we're giving you, just accept it and keep on, and that's not that's not right at all. So um, I get the comparison and because we, we've done it with the leagues and where the WNBA was compared to where the NBA was at this time. Now the WNBA is going in year 25. It's, it's amazing, and it's going to continue to grow, and I'm excited about it because it gives so many young girls uh, more opportunity to, to – can try and fulfill their dream. Well, something I did want to add, I had Delisha Milton Jones on my series last year and she said going in, she came over from the ABL, but she said athletes like herself, they knew they were going to be the trailblazers. Like this wasn't going to be the end point, what they accomplished. They saw themselves as providing the blueprint, the seeds that will create opportunities for her successors. And you know, they, they took it on. You did what you had to do to make sure you were compensated effectively for your time. Uh, but as you were are talking about, folks like yourself and all the teammates you mentioned, all the people you went against, you know, if it wasn't for you, maybe we don't get those opportunities you're seeing now for the athletes that are coming up like Stewie or Asia Wilson, the rookie of the year or Collier, I know she's playing overseas, danger field. Right. And, and, you know, if you still play overseas, you know, that's fine because uh, only you can decide what's next in your life. But Maya Moore comes to mind too. I mean, how yeah. crazy is it for an athlete to stop at the prime of her career to focus on criminal justice reform? If that happened in any other league, it would have been front page news and top story on ESPN and not to say that Maya's – choice to sit out wasn't recognized, but I think it goes back to, you know, it takes the trailblazers, the folks like yourself to get the foundation in place. And then others, as you're talking about, as they recognize, we don't have to be robots that we are athletes, we are humans, and we lead the same yeah. as everyone else. <laughs> so we matter. You yes. up, right. You can speak up for yourself. So uh, I think you're right. I'm with Delisha being a trailblazer. Um, and I think we're all trailblazers for those that's coming before. And what Maya did to in my in my opinion, um I think speaks volume of her. It's just another side of her. everybody know Maya to be a winner on all levels and to be competing and to win in college and come and win in the WNBA and win in the Olympics and just a, a, a born winner. But how many people get to step, step aside and say, I want to win for someone else. I want to do something that's a little, that's meaningful, that has a different type of feel that, that like is, uh, that's going to give me a, a different type of purpose. And I think that's what people lose sight of. Like we get, most people that are fans get so attached to the game and we know the game bring us together, but there's so much more. Like we talked about earlier, there's so much more to each and every one of us. And you think about it, you're winning, you're at the peak of your game and you know, you, you're winning on all cylinders, but I think, and this, and I haven't spoken to my yet at all, but it's like, what is my purpose? And if my purpose is to make a difference, if my purpose is to bring about change, not just in a basketball form, I tip my hat off to it and I wholeheartedly appreciate it and have watched the story as it, develop and it's, it has come about um, to do something a little bit more meaningful and purposeful is an amazing thing. Now, reflecting on your playing career a little more here, Tamika, I would not dare ask you who your favorite teammate was because you have so much respect for the players that you got to meet along the way that you're still friends with, whether it was a bench player like Alexis Gray Lawson, only there for a couple of years, but you still speak highly of her and, or someone like Delisha Milton Jones, who played in 499 career games until Sue Bird passed her for the all-time spot. Uh, but what are some 
moments or memories you recall with any of your teammates that you got to play with? Uh, what are some moments that stick out that symbolize not only the athleticism we got to see every night, but the friendships and the camaraderie that comes with it? Um, hmm. Phoenix was always fun. We did a lot of things together with Diana, to, uh, Diana of course, Penny, Tangela Smith, the Warner Bonner, um, Nicole Willingham, all those people, Bridget Pettis, like those, those were fun moments because it was a true sisterhood. We spent time together. We did what we needed to do. We, we ate together. We went out. We learned each other off the court. Um, I'll tell you this story though. Before, before I became teammates with Tina Thompson, she was in LA. And I was playing on another team. We were playing against them. And I'll never forget, uh, Andrea Riley was on their team. And Andrea and I are both small point, uh, small point guards. And we're going at it. And I don't really, I know who Tina is, of course. But I've never really had very many conversations with her uh, other than speaking and stuff like that. And Andrea is her teammate. Andrea and I are going back and forth. We're saying things. And Tina interferes. And she stops me. And she says... To me, that's not your character. That's not your personality. She's like, don't do that. I've always had respect for her. Um, and I respected her even more in that moment. And it allowed me to see who Tina was as a person, even with the uniform on. She didn't go at her teammate. She came at me because of what she's seen from afar, what she's probably heard from me or what she knew that I was a competitor, but not one that always talked or anything like that. And she corrected me. I appreciated that to this day when I became her teammate, just to see how she carried herself, how she fought and how she practiced night in and night out and uh, how she would carry herself and speak to the young ones or whatnot. I, I had a great appreciation for her, And that's a friendship that I value to this day. Tanisha Wright, we would, we would pray together. We would talk about almost anything when we needed to. Camille Little. Uh, we would talk about whatever it is that we needed to. So I have a great appreciation for it. Um, and there are so many others that I can name. Dewana Bana, uh, even though she was younger. Uh, D Diana Tarasi, when we needed to. Kathy Pondexter. You know, like it was just fun moments. And um, it's kind of hard to pinpoint one or two. I had 11 years in the WNBA, so there were a lot of surreal moments and a lot of fun times with many different people. And that's why I phrased the question the way I did, because you, you never forget that experience. But it did lead me to think it's like, hey, your teammates included. Well, you were in Seattle. You're so famous. You were the all time you know, leader in games played. Yes, it's super phenomenal these, as well. Yep. I, I'm just looking at some of these uh, totals here. And here we go. I'm, Tina Thompson, Diana Tarazi, one, two in career points. So like you got to play alongside some royalty there, Tamika. I did. I was a, I was a fortunate point guard. I had Lisa Leslie, Shamika Holscar, Candice Parker, Kathy Pondexter, Diana Tarazi, Tina Thompson, Delisha Milton Jones, Sue Bird, like you, you name them. I was going to say, yeah, Dupree. It's like, I think I'm looking at everyone in the top 10 and I think you were teammates with everyone except Tamika because you did not play for Indiana. Right. Tamika catchings. Right. The, the other Tamika. <laughs> but I have a, that's another somebody, that's another person that I have a great deal of respect for. Somebody that I respected hands down, both on and off the court. Um, and the way that she carried herself and the way that she loved the game and competed for it. I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't even mention catch because she's a phenomenal, um, a phenomenal athlete, but a really special human being. Well, if she sees this, I don't think she'll hold it against you. It's tough to remember <laughs> so many players in this league, but it's I like, hope not. Yes, you know I got nothing but love. <laughs> <laughs> and I have great respect for her, too. Uh, she and I talked a few times uh, while she was still playing. And like I said, I don't have many bad stories to say about WNBA athletes. Now, I can only speak as a media member, but much like yourself, it's like, no, I don't really have anything. It's like, even if I tried, I mean, I'm not a combative person, so I'm not into dirt or scoops or gossip like that but it's like no you everyone that i can think of just genuine some were <laughs> a little more nervous than others when it came to doing interviews but it's right. like, no nobody tried punching me in the face nobody blew me <laughs> off it's like no it's like 
hey, you're somebody too. So, and you're a part of that. And I respect that. If you don't I, mind- I want to say this, I want to say this before you go. Like you, well, one of the things that you talk, we talk about the game, you talk about the women and how we carried ourselves and respected ourselves, but at that we were also trying to do what we needed to do to continue to grow the game. And sometimes I don't think the media get enough attention. So thank you for actually wanting to be a part of it and wanting to share the stories, talk about our game, and that, because that absolutely means a lot. And I, don't, I, I think everybody needs to know and understand that we don't take that for granted. To know that there's people that's as just as invested in us and our game as we are in it um, speaks volume for you and all the other media people out there. So thank you. Well, Tamika, if your goal is to make me blush, I think it's working. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny you say that because over time, and some folks would give me flack if the Lynx didn't win a championship. They're like, oh, are you all right? I'm like, I know, like, you learn real quick when you're covering games, you have no control over what happens. So I don't get worked up about the result because I know there's nothing I can do about it. I just sit back, enjoy the ride, and, and try to make the most of this opportunity to be that window. But to go off your point, as I've gotten older, yes, I'm excited to cover games, but it's like the older I get, the less I care about who wins, if that makes sense. Like, right. <laughs> you know, there's a world out there, as we've seen, and as the WNBA yeah. players have illustrated these last couple of years. So, yes, we still celebrate champions, of course, but it's like, yeah, there, there are bigger things out there. But on the subject of champions, if you don't mind, what do you remember from that 2009 championship season? You were with Phoenix. It was your first year. You had played for a couple of teams by that point, and you mentioned some of your teammates. You had a young Dewana Bonner and Candice Dupree, who I thought Dupree wasn't on the 09 team. She came. Dupree, oh, she came later. That's right. She yeah. came later. Well, yeah. still, go ahead. Still, the best mid-range shooter I have ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to ask me, I'm sure you might have some input too from experience, but, uh, but you had Dana Tarazi, Cappy Pondexter was there, Penny Taylor, who had the moniker Penny effing Taylor. You probably heard about that <laughs> <laughs> because if you were playing against her, that's probably your reaction. Like Penny effing Taylor again. Uh, and if you, if you were playing with her, you would be like, yep, Penny yeah. effing Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know which word I meant to use, but I don't want to say on air to keep this clean. But you had a lot of great teammates, and you had to sweat it out against Indiana and Topeka Catchings in that five-game right. finals. Had to come back from two games, a two-one deficit. But what do you recall from that championship season? You know, every player has that dream of hoisting a WNBA title, whether it's one time, four time, five times, doesn't matter. When you we're in to the midst honest, of that run. Go ahead. Go ahead. It was absolutely amazing. Like uh, the way Corey and uh, Bridget and Julian and put the game plan together and the, the whole, that entire season, the way that we were able to come together and do what it is that we needed to do, knowing that we were competing uh, against a fierce competitor in, in Indiana Fever. The games were phenomenal. The scoring was ridiculous. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the first game was 121 to 116 or something, if I'm not mistaken. It was the crowds were uh, wholeheartedly invested. Uh, it was just a surreal feeling. And to be on that stage and to be uh, amongst the stage with some of the most talented women in the world, um, not just uh, in the WNBA, but the entire world, because, you know, Penny was from Australia and we had other people that was on uh, the roster and stuff like this. So it was it was a really fun moment and a really fun time. I um, mean, we, we were excited. Like you say, a young Duana Bonna, we had Tangela Smith um, that was there and knocked down a pivotal three for us. And it was just, it was, it was, I still get chills about it. I'm looking this up. So you're wondering Tamika and anyone else watching, I have a monitor next to me that I can use to reference things. And you were close to me. I think you said 121, 116. The uh -huh. was 120, 116, but you still got the win, which is what counts. And <laughs> like, I still think that's the highest scoring single game in a finals. Uh, and all five of those games, actually, uh, you guys ran up the score, but that was the identity of those Phoenix Mercury teams uh, with Corey right. Gaines, this run and gun and using uh, offense as your defense. Absolutely. Uh, you won the first one in 
amazing fashion and a very dramatic fashion on top of it. Indiana wins the next two. So, you know, if you don't win again, if you get beat another time, that's it. Uh, obviously, we know what happened. You were able to come back from 2-1 down, but as you were making your way through that 2009 finals, the highs of game one, the letdown of dropping games two and three, when you enter games four and five, what did you sense was different, and how do you think that put Phoenix over the edge? We're competitors. We know for a fact this winner go home. And I had just lost my grandmother the, the year before that, so everybody had different meanings of why it was important for them to win. I dedicated that season to her. And then again, I have Diana Taurasi on our team. I have Penny Taylor in the locker room. I have Kathy Pondex in the locker room. We have Corey Gaines that was a winner. Like we were all winners and all had came from phenomenal programs and uh, have been in the league well enough. We were seasoned enough. We know that the game, that that's just how the league is. And because of the games and stuff that we play and because of how things go, it's like you play a game, you forget about it because you own to the next. We learn from it. We must, we move forward. And that's what we did. And now we were, we was able to get game four at their place to send game five back to where we wanted it in front of our fans. And the X factor was, was great. I will say this Phoenix of all the cities that I've followed when I watch games on the league pass feeds, Phoenix, Seattle, those are two cities that have a, a legion of fans. I know Minnesota right. built those up when they got into their dynasty run, but Phoenix, it may not be 50,000 sellout crowd like an NFL game, but those who show up, they are passionate. Tamika, this probably is a, this may be an easy question, or I'm sure you've been asked this a lot, but after game five, when you knew you had pulled it off, you came back from two, one down. And no matter what, from that point on, you would always have WNBA champion next to your name. How exciting was that moment for you? It's a great moment. Like you say, it doesn't matter if it's one or it's five. You can't take it away from me. You're listed as a champion for the rest of your, uh, your career, the rest of your life. There are so many people that play an eternity and never get crowned uh, that champion. If it was easy, everybody would be able to do it. But to be able to do it, not just win it and win it in Phoenix, but to do it with the with the group of women that we were able to do it with was uh, absolutely amazing for my family, was able to see it and watch it and stuff like that. So it was great. Um, and we were extremely happy and we had a lot of fun. Now, I know most of you had overseas commitments at that time, but were there any celebrations that you got to have with your Phoenix teammates after you won? Any opportunities to unwind and let loose and, <laughs> and yell? Unwind, no, we, we absolutely, I mean, we unwinded after the game and we played with each other. Uh, I mean, we uh, had a celebration with each other, um, you know, a couple of days afterward, and then all of us had to leave. And then we were able to, you know, get our rings and stuff the following year. But we had enough time to enjoy it and have fun, but it was time to get back to work. Now, looking back at your WNBA career, you mentioned some of the teammates you were proud to play alongside with. Who would you say was the toughest player to go against? That's a question that's hard to answer as well. You have the best players in the world, all in the in the biggest women's league in the world. But I, before I became her teammate, Kathy Pondex, it was very difficult to guard. Um, really, really, really uh, difficult. So um, I know, and Sue Bird too, because she 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 would run off with so many screens, and if it wasn't screens without the ball, it was screens with the ball in her hand. So, um, but I would have to say Kathy Pondex there. She's uh, Fierce with the ball, with the basketball. Um, she can either, she can rock you to sleep with it. She can pull up and shoot over you. She can get to the basket and use her body well. Um, and also Lindsay Wellen. Uh, Lindsay Wellen was also I can't I cannot be on this phone call and not mention one of Minnesota's finest. So um, you know those two or those three were uh, very tough. It is tough. I was wondering if you might have put your LSU teammates in there because you had to go against Simone and Sylvia more than a few times as well. But Sue Bird and look and her longevity, she's still at it. She won her she won her fourth title. And she, awesome. Yes. And, and close to 40, and she's still going strong. And that speaks volume of Sue and how well she takes care of her body and stuff, and how much the people believe in her and allowing her to continue to play and what she brings to the game and her leadership and her voice. Um, as far as me naming Sylvia and Simone, I never had to compete against them. 
I never had to compete compete against them in the like I never had to guard them myself personally. So um, that part, um, I, I'll tell you this: when we first got in the WNBA, and we were we were on separate teams. Simone did something, and I was so used to giving her a high five. She got an and one, and she was going to the free throw line, and I walked by and almost slapped her hand. I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> <laughs> well, but, and then, um, you were by to be. This is a very strange, like specific. A reference, but when they did a look, a flashback or a retrospective on the '91 Finals, Magic Johnson, you might have seen this in an interview. He saw Michael Jordan do that uh, reverse, or he goes up and switches hands midair to get the layup. And <laughs> Magic, for a moment, is like, "Did he just do that?" And then he's like, "Oh wait, I'm playing against him." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it sounds like that's yeah. what happened to you. Samoa gets the M one. You're like, "Oh right," and you're like, "Wait a minute, I'm going against her. I can't cheer for you." <laughs> exactly. But, exactly. But hey, you know what? She got to win Rookie of the Year like you did uh, the, when she came in the next year. So I'm sure there were plenty of celebrations there. And as I and I can tell, like you're just ha you're happy and proud for everybody, whether you had to go against them or you got to play alongside them. Maybe it was a good thing though that they didn't they didn't put you on Simone or Sylvia because that could have gotten ugly. I know you would not back down even against Sylvia. Right, and neither one of them would back down against me. So it definitely <laughs> would have got ugly real fast. But at the end of the day, we would have. Shook each other's hand, hugged each other, and it was all right. It's time to go eat or you know, go out several ways. So your final year in the WNBA was 2015. You played overseas for a couple more seasons after that. At the start of this podcast, you said your journey into coaching was by accident. Like that wasn't something you were planning to do. But I know in addition to your time as an athlete, you've have published children's books and now you're coaching. So when you knew that your time as a professional athlete was done, what were some things you were considering and how did this coaching opportunity come across your lap? Oh, uh, to be honest with you, uh, you, if you want to hear God laugh, you tell him your plans. <laughs> we, we plan God, God laughs, laughs, right? Yeah. So uh, it was all God and what he wanted me to do for the youth. Um, and so I followed his lead and I'm absolutely happy that I did. Um, it's not, it's not everybody's journey takes them in a different way to go wherever it is that he see fits. Um, so I think with me being able to be the point guard, which was a coach on the floor for my entire career, it helped me to transition into it. For some people, it was a no brainer. They just automatically knew that I was going to be a coach. I was like, no, I don't. You think I want to put up with somebody like me? I know how I was as a, <laughs> as a player. So, um, but once I got into it, it's still the same thing. You're still passionate. You're still competitive. And to be able to share the knowledge that you've uh, obtained over the years with those that are looking to uh, evolve their game, uh, it becomes the norm, honestly. So did you have anything specific in mind when you left? Like, okay, this is what I want to do. Or were you just uh, saying, I'm going to let God take control? I actually wanted to have my own gym, my own academy, my own facility. I want to be able to have my own schedule, be able to do things with the youth in the community because I still have my foundation and all this kind of stuff. Now I'm a head coach <laughs> for a high school that's about to get her master's in about a month. So um, it's, it's what, like I said, tell God your plan and watch him laugh. Not just a head coach, a state champion head coach. Don't sell yourself short, Tamika. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I did want to follow up on that. We talked a little bit about your state tournament run, of course. How do you think your time as a player, being the coach on the floor as the point guard and getting to experience so many things as a player in overseas leagues and then the WNBA, you got to see a lot, uh, hundreds of hundreds of players I'm sure you've been teammates with or played against. How did that help prepare you for your first head coaching assignment? Uh, like you said, being the coach on the floor, uh, having to know the positions, knowing how to put your teammates in a, in a proper position, knowing everybody's role and all this kind of stuff, and knowing how to read uh, when they're on the run, when to control the tempo, when to settle it down, when to push it. I think those different uh, facets of the game has helped to transition. And me being a point guard actually helps me with my other point guards and allow me to be uh, some extra set of eyes for them um, and ask them like maybe what do we what is what about this did you see it from this perspective just to give a different look four eyes are better than two so 
Um, I think that part helps. And I've had that with other people, with other coaches, that with other point guards. And it was like, I, I saw this. I was wondering if you saw it and stuff like that. So I think me being uh, a coach on the floor helped 100% me transition into that position. How did you build your relationship with your athletes? Because I'm wondering, well, they already had the pedigree, but you know, they hear, oh, here's this first year head coach who happens to be a WNBA champion. So I don't know how familiar they were with you, but what was that first meeting like? And how do you think your relationship with the team grew to the time you won that state championship in division one? I. I think with the kids today, they, they need to know that you care. And I didn't go in there as a state, as a WNBA champion or anything that I went in there as Tamika Johnson, who's excited to be your head coach. My tenure is over. It's now your time. I just want to be able to help you in any way that I can. If you're willing to, to learn, I'm willing to teach. And we can, we can only do this together. I can't do this without you. You can't do it without me. We have to come together as one and get this thing accomplished. Um, I spent a little time with them let them know that I cared about who they were as a person, not just who they were as a basketball player. And I think it started to unravel and unfold from that, from that point. And I have to ask this Tamika, owing to your friendships in the WNBA, did you hit up Alexis Gray Lawson for advice at coaching high school ball? I didn't honestly, and I'm a little older than Lex, but I'm not, but I'm not too old to, to learn from anybody because she taught me, uh, she taught me when we played with each other, but I know if I needed to, I could. And she knows the same thing, vice versa, for sure. Had to have a little fun, of course. And you also spoke of your master's. You're one month away from officially getting it. I think you've completed the coursework or are you still? Is pretty there- much. And there, are there. It's still, it's still some labor, but it's pretty much done. The foundation and everything is laid out. I can finally see the light. I'm at the end of the tunnel and I'm extremely happy about that. Um, well, I'm getting that master's in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and leadership. Um, so I'm excited about it. Entrepreneurship. Well, I, I know some folks that I might want to get you in touch with because I have some other uh, other black women actually who are looking to uh, stake a claim in entrepreneurship. And you know, much like the WNBA using itself as a space to promote the idea that women can play sports, you know, here right. you are. I don't know if you're thinking about that consciously, but just your presence alone, I think, could tell others that, hey, you can do this too. Absolutely. And I think I try to use that and use my size to my advantage and let them know. There are so many people that told me what, what they thought I couldn't do because of my size uh, um, and my height and all this kind of stuff. Like, listen, you can do whatever you put your mind to. And here I am, a living proof um, of it. So I definitely uh, will and I definitely do and will continue to spread that message. And I'm going to hold you up on that, too, that, that on that connection uh, with those other like females, Mike. <laughs> oh, T- Tamika, I follow my word. So when we're done... That is the first thing I'm going to do because I am not, I've seen this happen so many times and you know, life happens. People sometimes forget, but I've come across folks that are all talk, but they can't back it up. And it's like, no, I know these people. And that's why I continue covering sports. I've built so many connections that way. And this is how you do it. I do want to ask you though, how excited are you to get your master's after you finished your playing career? I know you graduated early actually and then you got to complete another year at lsu so you already had the bachelor's but now you're going to have a master's on top of that i don't know how many fellow athletes pursue the same track i think uh imani mcgee stafford is pursuing a law degree now yes there's many that have it but i'm excited about it and i i promised my grandmother before she passed away literally after i graduated um from LSU as soon as I handed her my diploma because that was the only thing that meant everything to her. As long as I had that paper, I had my degree, she was fine. As soon as I gave it to her, she was like, are you going to start working on your master's? I was like, lady, I just finished and I finished early. You're not even giving me a chance to exhale. But I did make her a promise and told her that I would get my master's and I'm true to my word. And I started it when I was overseas, but I didn't have as much time as I thought that I was going to have. And I don't like to start something and don't finish it. So um, I'm extremely happy and I hope that she's proud and she's smiling down um, because I, I, I kept my word and I accomplished it. I told my mom, you know, the same thing. And the next thing came out of her mouth was, OK, maybe you can start working on a Ph.D. or get your doctor. I was like, I never told you that I wanted all these initials. I just I made one promise and I kept it. So I'm, I'm extremely excited. I'm extremely happy to accomplish uh, something new, something else. 
Well, Samika, there are a few things that I want to touch on before we wrap this up that I ask of all my guests in this podcast series. Throughout your career, at any point, high school, college, Mm -hmm. pro, what was the most exciting moment and the most embarrassing moment? (laughs) The most exciting moment would have to be us winning. Uh, winning the championship in in high in college, but I'll tell you, in high school I had a quadruple double. I scored uh, sixty three points. I had eleven assists, ten steals, and t- ten rebounds. And I, I was extremely excited about it because half the people couldn't believe it. So when it came out in the newspaper the next day, I got all kind of messages and phone calls like, "Who were y'all playing? And what happened?" And, like that was the first time that I caught fire like that, and it was just uh, unstoppable. So, those two will probably be some highlights. The WNBA championship was amazing for us, for for us and for myself. Embarrassing moments would probably be the Final Four, um, turning the ball over with the last five seconds, um, and watching them win and stuff like that. That was probably like one of the most embarrassing moments, but it actually helped me grow. So, um, in that moment of what could have been despair, help it actually helped me grow. I get that feeling, Tamika. I can't say I I can speak from experience. I don't have that athleticism, but I think as an athlete, you, it always sucks when it feels like you're the one responsible. Obviously you bounce back from it, but I can imagine in the moment, it's probably a really tough time because you feel like you let everyone down. And in hindsight, you think you realize, no, this just happens. It just, I just happened to turn the ball over at, at the worst, you don't, win, you, don't, you don't win the game in five seconds. Right. Um, but it was a it, it, it was a pivotal five five seconds, and that's one that will uh, I think I will remember for a very long time. But it doesn't affect me though. Like I always rem- I always remember it for a teaching thing, in a teaching moment, in a moment to grow. Well, and hey, it happens. Arika Gumbawale a couple of years ago missed a free throw that could have helped Notre Dame win a championship. And I bring up the time where Maya Moore failed to score a point in a WNBA game. It happened once. Uh, And when I bring that up, people are like, really? Did that? I'm like, yes. And I remember that because I covered that game. I watched them. It was against San Antonio. The Lynx won because Taj McWilliams Franklin hit a game winner late with 1.3 in the clock. But I remember looking at the box score and going, wow, Maya didn't score. But Maya would be the last person to care about that. I digress. And then that quadruple double, I'm like, you know what? That doesn't surprise me because when I was doing a little bit of prep work, it's like, that's right. You got a few triple doubles in the WNBA too. Uh, Only one, only one. I I wish I had more than one. I think that's one more than how many, how many don't get a triple double. So that's one more than. I think the list has grown. I think the list has grown to about (laughs) seven or eight now so but i was i was excited to be able to do it um and everybody else that has done it was probably uh six feet and above so <laughs> you, you probably were the shortest <laughs> but <laughs> hey, there's well, a probability about that i definitely was the shortest <laughs> well and i say that because i think well you were there shannon bobbitt was five foot two you're five foot three so i don't know what yeah. she did but like i said a triple double not an easy thing to do so you're part of an exclusive club could be a trivia question down the road, Tamika. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Looking back at all of your experiences, writing children's books, coaching high school ball for John Curtis, winning a WNBA championship, playing in the Final Four, uh, you would probably need a whole book just to list everything you've done. But looking back on everything you've accomplished in sports and elsewhere, what would you tell a younger version of yourself? That the future is bright. Uh, honestly, and, to, and even in the tough moments, continue to fight because you you do land on your feet. You, you do end up um, being successful. You end up being happier than what it looked like or what it is that you could be going through. Um, I would tell my younger self to continue to persevere and continue to push through. And this question is based on a question that I see in a media guide that I purchase every year for the high school season. And I like to throw this out there to my adult friends as well. What would you say is the most unusual thing about yourself that no one would expect if they approached you for the first time? I absolutely enjoy spending time by myself. 
like I can do practically. I go eat by myself. I can go to the movies by myself. I I enjoy me. And most people find that hard to believe that like you just go do things on your own. Like, why won't you invite this? Or do you want me to come? I was like, no, I'm good. And it's 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 a little surprising to to folks. Um, some people used to think that I was very mean, and I'm definitely not. Um, and I think it's I think because I smile more now, it makes me a little bit more approachable. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think people are more surprised that I can pretty much take a vacation by myself, go do things by myself. And what things that everybody would do with someone else when they think it is more fun, I enjoy it either way. I laugh when you say that, Tamika, about how people thought you were mean because it goes back to what we said earlier about what folks think of Diana Taurasi, for example, or Candace right. Barker, or all these players when we only get to see them on the court. It's right. different when you're interviewing them before the game or after the game when you don't have to put your game face on. Right. You're absolutely right about that. And if you don't mind me asking this, Tamika, I don't know. Maybe there's a story behind it. Maybe there isn't. But your social media handles, you go by Quick Deuce on Twitter and Instagram. I can <laughs> figure out where the deuce came from. How did Quick Deuce come together? Mike, don't act like I wasn't fast. And it just I, stuck. I just haven't changed it. it really was, I thought it you was, were the slowest person I have ever saw in the WNBA. I'm kidding. Really? Oh, <laughs> I, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm kidding. But no, I just, uh, I, it's like. That's pretty much where it came from. Like me being uh, fast and wearing a number two. So it was just quick deuce. Instead of just putting a number in there, I just put up the, I mean, deuce. That's it. And I probably should change it. Um, I'm still now, I'm still kind of quick. Um, just don't have to utilize it the way that I did. Then I probably should change it to, you know, Coach Johnson or something. Right. But uh, we'll see. Tamika, that's part of your brand identity. I'd say own it. I'll, okay, for you, how Mike. Many, how many players get to keep the same number in their professional career? You You're bounced right. around several I, different teams, and sometimes and you got to change the numbers with up. The number two, I did. You're absolutely right about that. How did the number two come about? What was your fascination with the number? It actually wasn't a fascination. It's, it's a crazy, it's a simple story. Honestly, I wore number 20 in high school. It was retired when I left. Um, when I got to LSU, Keisha James, the point guard in front of me was wearing number 20. So I just took the number two from the number 20 and kept it. <laughs> and the rest is history. It's like, hey, two works. Why? <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Right. But no, I think, yeah, quick deuce because it's like how many can use and it just rolls off the tongue. Like Coach Johnson would probably work, but there are a lot of Johnsons out there. How many quick deuces? And maybe you don't have that same 40-yard dash speed that you once did, but I'd like to think you could still uh, outrun a few people. I definitely can. I definitely, as long as we don't have to go a long, long distance, I can get you in about the good 60 yards. <laughs> 60 yards, okay. And No, I'll, I'll get you in 100. 100, oh, I like that attitude. Like, <laughs> I can still do it. We were talking about the WNBA celebrating its 25th season, the silver anniversary season. Mm -hmm. You see what athletes are doing now, whether it's activism with the bubble last year or these additional career entries on the resume, Candace Parker turning into a commentator with the inside the NBA crew and the NCAA tournaments and she and Dwayne Wade have hooked up quite well. And you probably saw this earlier in the week where she shot down Shaq's suggestion of lowering the rims. And she's like, my next kid is going to do a step back dunk. Just you watch or a break step dunk or something like that. <laughs> and yeah. so many alumni entering the coaching profession and succeeding Delisha Milton Jones and Don Staley. I know uh, Cheryl Soups gave it a go. Tina Thompson at Virginia alongside yes. uh, Monica Wright, another WNBA alumni. Correct. And Sue Bird launching her own media brand, right? The other brand with a few other uh, notable names in the industry. So I think you were saying earlier, there was a time where athletes maybe would have been happy just to play, get the paycheck and accept it. We're seeing a much different tone. And so as the WNBA celebrates its 25th season, how cool is it for you to be a part of that? And how cool is it for you to see your successors take up so many causes, whether it's activism, other careers, but just owning themselves in a much more assertive way than we saw 
even 10 years ago? I think it's absolutely great. I think it's amazing. Um, we talk about use, utilizing our platforms to the best of our abilities. And most of the time, most of the time people think that we're using it for basketball uh, or we're using it to continue to be the role models. And yes, that's true, but there's so much more to us. And for uh, my sisters in the WNBA to utilize this platform to uh, branch out and become entrepreneurs um, in different areas and different fields to give others something to connect to and look, look at and see in a different light, I think it's absolutely great. And I wish every last one of them a super, super, super success. This might sound like a crazy question to me because we have covered a lot of ground, but is there anything else about your story that you would like to add, whether it's in sports or elsewhere? Well, I have a foundation that I absolutely love uh, and it gives back to the at-risk uh, um, students uh, and kids. Uh, I have a clothing line that I'm working on as well that I'm going to start pushing out hopefully very, very soon. Um, some different gear and stuff like that. Um, just trying to walk through the doors that are open uh, up for me and make sure that I am able to open up doors for others as well. Are there any more children's books on the way? I think so. Um, and that's one of the things that uh, one of the people that you mentioned, Alex, and I uh, communicate about our reach back out to him and, you know, see what he thinks, because Alex has helped me with um, he's helped me with writing my books and letting me know um, my that I was talented enough to to write. He's helped me with uh, forming the ideas and coming along with everything and has forced me to push forth and um, writing it because writing it started out as an outlet for me just to be able to, to write. And I think that there is because there are more stories that need to be told. You know what? I could see you maybe taking over as host of Reading Rainbow if uh, LeVar Burton decides to step down with your involvement in uh, books and writing and <laughs> literacy. <laughs> I don't think there's anything you couldn't do, Tamika, with everything you're doing. And it's cool to hear that you're looking at launching another part of your brand, your clothing line. That you See, that's where I think Quick Deuce would fit. I got you. I got I you. And I'll, be sure, I mean, I'll, be sure to make, I'll make sure that you get some of it, too, Mike. And I <laughs> Okay, well, I appreciate that, but just it's like, I mean, Quick Deuce has a stronger marketing potential, I think, than Coach Johnson. I don't know what you think, but just from my perspective, I, I think you might be right about that. I need to make sure that I can still be quick, though, to keep the name. <laughs> hey, you know what? We always have the tape, we can watch your highlights. So even if you don't have that same speed as before, it's like, no, you were really, really fast. And <laughs> I actually see that a lot out of shorter players and taller players too. So let's not uh, throw shade on some of the bigger men and women out there. I okay. work with JR All-Star as a basketball analyst. So I break down film from their network of states, uh, including, you know, this SEC territory down south. And mm -hmm. what really impresses me is just how versatile some of these athletes are that you can be six feet and sprint down the floor or six, three, six, right. four. you don't have to be the bruiser, the big log, uh, like the old days. And you know, likewise, when I see shorter players succeed, like, Hey, don't let height get in the way. Now dunking, you'd have to work a little harder. I think to, uh, reach just a little bit and Sylvia Fowles or Candace Parker. But <laughs> I, yeah. if there was a way for you to do it, I'm sure you would pursue it. You're absolutely right. Like you said before, Mike, you believe that there's not anything that I couldn't do. And if I if I was to ever dunk, they would have to take the rim down because I'm not coming down or I'm not. You, you're, I need to take this entire rim back to my house with me. We'll get another one, but I need this one right here. <laughs> All right. We'll have to keep that in mind. So watch out, John Curtis. If Tamika is able to throw it down, you're going to have to get another rim. <laughs> absolutely. Well, Mike, I definitely appreciate you having me on. Um I have another encounter that I have to uh, to get to. This is a great, 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 great interview, and I absolutely enjoyed it. I will hold you to the things that we talked about. I'll make sure you get some of that gear as well. All right. This will definitely not be the last time, and I think it's a great uh, segue to close this up and set the stage for the next chapter for whoever comes along and shares your story. But thanks again, Tamika Johnson. You can find her on social media, at Quick Deuce on Twitter and Instagram, and... Be on the lookout for those new product lines, whether it's a children's book, clothing, anything, or her foundation. So thanks again, Tamika, and thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for having me. Have a great day.
Thanks. And if you want to do the same on a future episode, just hit us up on social media at the Mike Deaton on Twitter or Instagram. All you need is a good story and we are happy to share it. So until next time, thanks for watching.